So um, today is a very popular one where we are going to um, go through project management and program management and the difference between the two because they are very different. Um, delighted to have one of our very own previous candidates, Sam Butler from MACE as our pro project manager. And we will have John Roos joining us from Turner and Townsend, who is one of our mentors and will be talking about program management. So over to you, Angela, sit back and enjoy. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Caroline. So welcome to our virtual career chat. I am Angela Forbes and it is a pleasure to welcome you in the week that saw the coronation of our king. So whether it was in a formal capacity or a celebratory one, I hope you enjoyed the weekend events. Now, as we enter the Carolean era, you too will commence your next chapter. So these virtual chats are to aid that. We bring the careers and employers in construction closer to you now that you are resettling and even my gardeners joining in. So apologies about that. Now, as a treat today, you will hear from two marvellous veterans working for two astounding employers presenting two very impressive career options. So we extend a very warm welcome to Sam Butler, Consultant Project Manager from Mace Consult, and to John Roos, Associate Director, Programme and Project Management at Turner and Townsend. So without further ado, we will hand over to our first speaker, Sam, to kick us off. We'll switch our cameras off, Sam. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Caroline. And I'm I'm not lucky enough to have a gardener, so hopefully that uh, that <laughs> won't necessarily get in the way of the uh, the meeting. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, as as Caroline and Angela said, I'm Sam Butler. Uh, was in the Royal Engineers um, for well seven years. So what I'm going to do is talk to everybody today about my kind of journey from military to civilian, um, my transition the transferable skills and then finally finally with the uh, day in the life of and then my reflections on how I've actually transitioned it's been kind of a year now since I left uniform so commissioned into the Royal Engineers in 2016 uh, spent 15 months in the Falklands uh, as a troop commander and a ops officer while out there basically being a project manager and a program manager uh, on a project called Project Animoy. Uh, from there, did six months as an ops officer in an EOD squadron, uh, then 14 months as a 2IC in that squadron before returning back to doing ops and then going on for, uh, four months or uh, two months of op rescript, finalising with a uh, regimental ops officer at 1RSME, which is the Royal Engineers kind of trade, trade training school. In my last year, I realized that I was leaving obviously and and basically where I was at the Royal Engineer School I, I got myself as qualified as I can so in my final year I did uh, project management call with the APM uh, I did MSP with a, uh, or managing successful programs with Axelos uh, and SMSTS so I kind of set myself up as best as I possibly could um, to uh, to transition into project management because that's what I ne needed to do for my actual transition, um, my for the first sort of six months of my transition, I did very little. I uh, played a lot of rugby. Was uh, lucky enough to get capped against uh, the RAF at King's Home. I'm sure there's probably a lot of a round of applause, but I can't hear you. Um, but I concentrated on that, and it was only until I fi finished that and I actually concentrated on my transition and build force really came into their own. So within probably two days of finalising my CV, sending it in to Angela and Caroline and then disseminating it out. I probably had four or five inf informal calls within, yeah, organised within two days and actually have the call within sort of five days. So I can't, I can't praise their service enough in what they did for me. And I secured a job with Mace uh, within two weeks of actually finishing in uniform. So even before I left uniform, I had a job so I was reasonably fortunate. Um, I then spent seven weeks uh, working on my house before joining Mace. So that's kind of my background and why I went into the the kind of project manager, because there's a lot of correlation between project management and being an ops officer effectively. So my my day to day job at Mace um, 
is it all kind of depends on what area of the of the life cycle you're in. So at MACE, we use something called the Reba cycle, which is a similar cycle to uh, what you do you use with the APM PMQ, uh, and it and my involvement is very is very different depending on what stage of that in. So in the earlier stages, when you get your project mandate and your project brief, you will effectively be carrying out options appraisals. So you'll be looking at um, what what you can do with the mandate you've been given. And my involvement is that is a lot of collaboration between the design team and the sponsor. Um, and that will be site visits. So once or twice, and you'll be taking your technical assi uh, assistance round. Um, and you'll be looking at that project and going into the detail of of what you can actually do with the building, the land or, or whatever you have to do. From there, you will uh, create those suggestions and you you will define the options with your design team and and the sponsor and, and basically create the options appraisal. So then you'll from there, you'll move on to your feasibility studies. And from there, you'll go into detail about what your what your for the option they've chosen. You'll go into detail about that. So my day to day running on on those kind of on, on those elements is far more kind of step back. It's more of a collaboration piece and collation of information and then creating those reports for the project sponsor to then take them to their relevant boards. Uh, to get their approvals. From there, you'll go into the business case side of it, which um, and, and my element of that is basically providing the information required for the project sponsor. So my involvement is um, actually just defining how much it's going to cost, working with the cost consultants and, that, and creating that cost plan for them. So they will go to the estates investment board as part of the MOJ um, and, and they will decide whether it goes forward um next step which i would get involved with is the tender side of it so for the tender i would i would end up um a lot well a lot of it is the collaboration piece i, I would create the tender pack with bringing in the tas making sure that everything's appropriate but then i'd be working with the end user so that would be site visits um look, working with them to make sure that the design we've created is actually feasible and works operationally uh, off the top of my head, the easiest one I can think of is a video conferencing centre at HMP Chelmsford is working with the the operational side of the prison to make sure what we're actually creating is is a workable option, whether or not the layout we've done, the, the risk mitigations uh, that we would impose, impose um, and they would highlight their own operational risk to why why the project can fail effectively. And from there, we would create the mitigation. We would we would incorporate those into the design. We would discuss with the cost consultants to make sure that the risk risk uh, element of it is costed correctly before sending it all out to tender. Uh, and depending on what level of tender it would, um, it goes to a direct award or or it will go out to, as a usual tender to three sort three options. And then from from that side of it, I would then evaluate all the tender packs and create the recommendations for the project sponsor to decide who who the tender is. Um, it's changed. It used to be uh, that basically the cheapest option that hit the quality line, but now actually the MOJ uh, have cottoned on to the fact that the that doesn't always get you the best product. Um, and actually, they they go into much more detail about the quality of the constructor or the contractor you're bringing on board, as well as the cost. Um, when it actually gets into the construction phase and the mobilization phase, actually the we take more of a step back and we um, will allow the contractor, the project manager of the contractor who we work with, they they will actually run the project, the detailed uh, minutiae of the project itself. And we we will maintain an eye on the progress. And then if the project is going to be behind, delayed, or if there's any changes, that's where we do the diligence for the, the, the sponsor themselves um, and create those options and, and make sure the, the sponsor is aware of why we've come to that solution um, and basically say yes or no to them spending money. Um, which is which is what what the end goal is really making it a as as cost effective as possible. Um, we then will carry on that will carry on throughout the construction phase that liaison. So for me, it's kind of going to sites once or twice a month, 
uh, depending on the state of, depending on the progress of the project, depending on the performance of the contractor. These are these are all things that will kind of um, change change my my time on site. The rest of the time, I kind of work from home or work from the London office. But sort of uh, most of the time, it's 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 office office based or, or home based. Um, and then when it gets to the handover, we will we will control the government soft landing. So that will make sure that the project itself can actually um, be handed over in a correct state to, to the spec that we've 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 uh, specified and to make sure uh, that the end user know what they're doing with it. So that's kind of as what I do day to day. I think when I hopefully that aren't, that kind of gives everyone a, an insight into that, because I know when I I transitioned, I actually struggled to understand what I would be doing every day. It's all well and good people saying, right, you're a project manager, This is you'll be managing a project, but that doesn't actually answer the question of what you do day to day. I'll, I'll be honest, a lot of my day to day is similar to what I was doing as an ops officer. A lot of it is kind of meetings, uh, teams calls, answering emails, but there is the opportunity to get out and about on site, check progress, go to site visits, um, and and actually have that input and even down things to down to things like checking on snagging progress and the and the quality output that they they're doing we get involved at that at that kind of minute level as well it's not as detailed as it would be if i was the contractor side but it is there are those opportunities um so that's kind of my day to day and then i think the the key thing for me as as people I, I was sat in your position kind of a year ago and I think there's a few things that I'll just mention that I either learned lessons from or or struggled with from my actual transition um, and I think there's a there's a few kind of key ones that I I struggled with when I first came in uh, to Mace and I think a big thing for me is coming from a military and having those um expecting a high quality um and wanting to perform at the best i possibly can uh every every day every stage i i actually quite struggled with the difference between their um uh the difference between the potential versus the performance a lot a lot of people will, will probably know the difference between soft and hard skills uh, soft skills being the com communication, uh, the leadership, the management, and then the hard skills being the actual in detail, how a company works, how how their processes are. Now, for me specifically, we are um, we are employed as ex-military personnel for our potential rather than our performance. And that took me a while to grasp because there's a lot of information that I still don't know now. There's a lot of processes that I still don't know now, but it's a constant learning and realisation that I'm not going to be that kind of perfect project manager that, um, that I probably thought I was going to be coming from a military background. Uh, and that was key, understanding that and understanding that you're you're not alone and actually uh, speaking to people, going into the office and getting that kind of networking, um, networking in. Because I think uh, this leads me on to my second point of um, the actual, uh, I, I definitely had to teach myself how to be a civilian, um, understanding my responsibilities, understanding where my kind of limit of exploitation was of making decisions and things like that. Um, which was a key thing, even things down to not realising that you had to, um, you didn't have to make a calendar appointment with someone that would be higher up in the hierarchy than you. You can just call them up. You don't have to book in with the adjutant to be able to speak to the CO. You can just go and speak to them. Um, there, there's that that kind of learning how to be a civilian was a key, was a key element for me. Um, and then the final, uh, the final thing I also struggled with was the client rep role versus the actual po project management role. Um, so project management that I expected it, and this was a steep learning curve for me. I thought I was going to be going in, doing the uh, the the workforce management, doing the the resource management, everything that I got told on my project management qualification, kind of day to day running of the actual projects themselves. Whereas the client rep the consultant project manager piece is that far more the kind of the step backwards, especially during the actual construction phase. Um, and that's something I really didn't realise before I joined Mace. The whereas I thought I was going to be in the weeds of it is absolutely the start and the kind of end piece is where we're responsible um, or 
or getting into the detail of the options, the feasibility and the business case. And that's kind of side of it. But actually, when the construction goes ahead, that's when you step back. And I think there's a key difference that um, people I've spoken to didn't quite realise the difference between although the consultant and the contractor PM sit under a project management umbrella, they are very different, uh, very different roles. Um, then finally, I'll just talk a couple of things that I would uh, just suggest before, if I had my time again, a um, couple of lessons learned sort of thing. Um, I think I went from the military straight into working on my house and then working at Mace. And I didn't allow myself any time to reflect. I, I basically didn't give my time to sit down and take that condor moment um, and, and relax. I only kind of had that until at Christmas. And at Christmas is actually when it hit me that the there was such a significant change. I, I didn't particularly think I was that institutionalized or anything like that. However, uh, it is a significant change moving from uh, from military to civilian life. It's, it's, I, I enjoyed it and I don't regret it at all, but I definitely regret not giving myself an opportunity to relax and and look back at my time and plan how I wanted to move into the future correctly and in, into MACE. Um, I think realising that uh, working from home uh, you're not alone. I, I found from working in, as part of an ops team, I would always be part of a team working with the, that environment, with, with the individuals around you. Um, working from home, I felt quite isolated to start with, but that's because I didn't understand kind of where my where I can talk to people and things like that. Uh, what I what I should be managing, what I should be looking to do. And actually that realisation that I can just speak to people on teams is with MACE, they've got the MACE military network. They they buddy you up with people. So you have that opportunity and those individuals to um, to lean on. Um, I think that's coming up to my time. Um, so I'll, I'll be here for any questions at the chat, but any questions at the end. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, uh, it's always an interesting one when you go second on one of these because uh, uh, obviously, the uh, the bar has been set, and Sam said it said it quite high. So hopefully, I will uh, follow on and compliment what he said, um, uh, and give you that sort of wider picture uh, as it leads into the program side of things, which has been my my focus for today. So uh, my name is John Roos. Um, I also was a commissioned officer in the Royal Engineers. Um, I uh, did 25 years and left in 2018 from the Army headquarters, uh, with my last role being a uh, policy. Uh, lead uh, in the combat support capability area um, focused around uh, both maintaining existing capability but also um, uh, new capability coming in uh, whether that's uh, <clears throat> uh, by whatever route whether that was through uh, defense equipment and support or, or elsewhere um, so um, my my last experience was very much uh, juggling uh, lots of balls in the air um, and uh, you know, each one of those, I suppose, could be considered to be a project in its own right. Um, and therefore, uh, my thinking when I came out uh, did sort of lead me towards uh, program management. While I was at uh, the uh, Army headquarters, I did uh, the managing successful programs training, um, uh, which uh, I did over a sort of a, a, a week's period. Um, uh, but interestingly, uh, one of the things you discover about um, how projects and programs are run within organizations is that the level of what's described as organizational maturity is quite important um, because uh, you can for instance get a, a team to come into an organization and create uh, a program um, uh, and it'll look uh, very much like it does in the uh, in the textbooks uh, but actually how you then deliver that is very much down to how the organization works and, and I'll come on to that uh, just reflecting in terms of my own experience so um, this is very much not uh, a deep dive into the sort of technical description between uh, what's a program and what's a project. Uh, in order to do that, obviously, you can go online and there's, there's lots and lots of material and certainly uh, uh, interesting looking at the sort of questions popping in the uh, in the chat bar about, you know, which is the right training to do. It's amazing how much of that information is actually available online uh, just to sort of uh, start to sort of read yourself into some of that concept. But um, in terms of um, 
uh, where I came from, uh, one of the things that uh, I became very uh, conscious of as I left was that there is a lot of um, project and program management uh, training available uh, within the defence uh, environment. Um, and and you know, everyone's heard of PRINCE2, uh, but actually, uh, you know, particularly in the sort of Royal Engineer environment, the sort of a pre professional focus around uh, project and, and program management, uh, the opportunity to do some of these courses is absolutely there. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, afraid to say that I very enthusiastically, having spent a lot of time focused on training, um, got a lot of my subordinates to, to go and do those courses, seeing the merit in them and didn't do them myself. So uh, uh, apart from MSP, uh, effectively, the point at which I started to pick up those qualifications was during resettlement, uh, doing uh, the APM uh, project management qualification uh, as part of my resettlement training. Uh, uh, but interestingly, you know, having stepped into my first role, um, and I'll come on to that. Um, the company wanted me to go and do Prince 2. Why, why Prince 2? What, what value would that add to what I was doing? Uh, the answer is uh, very little, but working in a consultancy environment, um, what clients want to be able to see is that you have that broad spread of, uh, of technical knowledge as well as experience. And therefore, you know, getting you into the client position is, is quite key. So um, on leaving uh, the army in 2018, um, I took a little bit of time out um, to uh, explore some options, uh, which have actually been great because one of the things that that has done uh, is allowed me to develop a, a series of um, activities outside work, uh, both in sort of particularly sort of charity volunteering, uh, but other stuff that I think if I hadn't taken that time and, and Sam referred to it as the condor moment, um, uh, would have taken me a lot longer to, to come by. And one of the things you're really struck by when you leave defense is that actually there's a whole load of time you never realized uh, is is very much work focused uh, and finding something to fill that time is quite important and, and I, I was ple pleased to have been able to do that during that period so my first role actually uh, was almost sort of six months after leaving quite deliberately uh, and that was stepping into a bath-based consultancy um, working in the defense and security sectors um, and one of the things I was very keen to do was to step away from uh, defense quite deliberately uh, so that if I was going to step into a project or program uh, environment uh, it came very much with that broader uh, experience and knowledge uh, rather than coming directly from defense. You are very much a product of your experience um, and uh, you know everyone leaving defense has a huge understanding and knowledge of both the uh, uh, the landscape, uh, the processes uh, and the people within it and therefore your marketability uh, as you step into civilian roles uh, is very much higher uh, if you step into a defense role because you've got those credentials. So uh, in doing that, I very much uh, took a sort of step down uh, in terms of you know salary pay and expectation uh, with the intention of building that broader experience uh, and uh, uh, and getting that uh, on my CV. So the, the first role I did in that sort of consultancy uh, was uh, working into the, uh, the Metropolitan Police uh, who had a major uh, uh, portfolio of change going on. Uh, if anyone's not aware, Met Police uh, is, you know, effectively consumes 25% of the uh, national policing budget, uh, a staff of 39,000 people. So it's a big organisation. Um, and uh, as part of a drive to save £100 million a year from their operating budget, um, they set up a major transformation po portfolio um, uh, with 12 major programmes uh, uh, sitting within it to deliver what's described as the strategic blueprint. One of the characteristics of um, program management for anyone who's not delved into the, the, the training of it, uh, which I assume will be most people on the call, um, is that um, there are some sort of key documents um, that sit within a program structure. Uh, I think, you know, when I was in my latter stages in the army um, uh, and thought back to various stages of life and roles that I'd had, um, I very much saw a program as just a, a, you know, a collection of associated projects. And, and to a large extent, it is. Um, but actually, uh, you know, when you look at the sort of purest form of program management, uh, it is very much about having that uh, broad uh, uh, vision of where you're trying to to get to, you know, what outcome are you seeking uh, in, in terms of the change that you're putting in place, and uh, the the key document that sort of de describes that is is very much expected to come top down uh, from uh, the management of the organisation uh, in the form of a mandate, 
Um, and then from that, in the same way that you would extract from orders, um, your um, you have an, a, a senior responsible officer who's appointed. Uh, generally, uh, it depends on the size of the organisation as to who that might be. But effectively, it's their role to then draw out from the uh, the mandate, which uh, describes the sort of benefits uh, to be uh, realised uh, from uh, the the programme. Um, develop a program plan and uh, create what's called the, the program blueprint uh, and effectively for the Met Police delivering that blueprint uh, of, of what life in the future would look like once all these programs have been delivered uh, what was the key thing. Um, my role, uh, I was uh, placed into the uh, portfolio office. So portfolio effectively if you work on that cascade hierarchy, uh, portfolio program uh, project is how it works and therefore those 12 programs were all reporting up into a portfolio office um, and, and within that uh, the centre of excellence effectively was the arbiter of good taste around process um, and the, the sort of technical approach to uh, both uh, investment appraisals so uh, business cases you know securing the money um, uh, for the the, the projects that sat in those sort of program areas. So a huge amount of um, information to process in order to make sure that everything is aligned to that, uh, that, that main blueprint, that strategic vision of what they're trying to deliver. Um, and, you know, it was a fantastic insight in terms of uh, how, a, how a big organisation affects change um, and, you know, that actually for a program the important aspect of that is that there is some kind of uh, framework rather than just a, a sort of loose affiliation of disparate projects which you're keeping an eye on and you know I think from my first role as a, uh, a as a troop commander uh, with being deployed on operations in the Balkans and having a number of sections working in different places arguably you could say that was a program of work because it was all delivering after the same um, uh, security uh, function but um, as I said, that, that sort of distinction when you start getting into big organisational change in programmes is about um, the, the key uh, building blocks of the programme and that strategic vision uh, that sees uh, an organisation go from where it is to where it wants to be. So, um, uh, having worked at the Met Police, I then moved um, uh, organisations uh, and I stepped into National Highways, uh, so uh, the organisation that looks after the strategic road network for, for everybody else, effectively motorways, um, and uh, uh, and the, the particular function I, I walked into uh, was being the uh, senior project manager for National Highways, advising Heathrow Airport Limited uh, on its plans for creating the third runway um, and how it would effectively drop the M25 Western section underneath the third runway, uh, that section being the busiest uh, section of motorway in the country. So, you know, within that, you effectively got uh, the Heathrow expansion project, um, which to all intents and purposes was a programme of activity because each of the subsets of that work, you know, were multi-million pound projects in their own right. Um, uh, and, you know, trying to tackle each of those elements of it uh, as a sort of co coherence um, with the overall plan of, of creating that runway. Um, sadly, uh, that particular uh, role for me was fairly short-lived uh, as the National Airport strategy got challenged, um, but I did remain with National Highways um, and uh, stepped into their regional infrastructure program, which brings us back to programs. So effectively, um, for National Highways, uh, one of the things, which is an arm's length body, so effectively that is uh, publicly funded, but with its own autonomy to uh, run itself rather than being part of the civil service. Um, and um, in a, a means to try and sort of shape uh, the planning over a sort of 15 year period, uh, they uh, ge generated the uh, roads investment strategy, uh, so working on five year chunks with a, a, a vote of money that, that sat alongside it. Uh, and uh, effectively, um, a, a program of activity that created a framework that um, uh, developers could bid into um, uh, to deliver key projects within that. Um, so um, this is 
probably worth mentioning here that you know that that distinction where we say you know are you a program manager are you a project manager well you know it, in in the sort of commercial environment within project and program management uh, it, it's not quite as cl a clean a split because if you have a small organization you can be a program manager managing a whole raft of projects uh, with a clear mandate but actually it's quite a small entity uh, equally you go and work for an organization like national highways uh, which I went into as a senior project manager, uh, but the, the, the single project I was working on within that uh, program of works under the regional infrastructure program uh, was a 200 million pound uh, plus uh, uh, motorway improvement uh, scheme uh, in the area around Winchester between the M3 and the A34. Uh, and, you know, I think that's really a consideration as you're sort of stepping out into that environment, considering what you want to do, that actually, f for me, um, while you know, it, it's a single project because it's a single location and the rest of it. The subsets within that, and um, uh, Sam referred to uh, the, the stage of the, the project life cycle. Um, uh, and, you know, if you get an opportunity to do go and have a look at um, National Highways, uh, who publish a lot of stuff on online about their uh, project management approach, um, uh, because they, they've very clearly broken this down into a sort of pre-project phase, an options phase, uh, development and construction and depending on you know how and when you join some of these uh, organizations and jump into a particular project or program will very much depend on what your lived experience is on a day-to-day -day basis and, and and Sam's talked about you know what, what he's been doing in a sort of project environment so you know for me going into that uh, project level um, actually, uh, a lot of the things that I was doing there are very much things I'm now doing as a program manager with Turner and Townsend, and I, I will come on to that. Um, uh, in that, I, I'd taken on a, a project which uh, had just lost its designer, um, and uh, it was considered to be running over over budget over time, um, and with a design that, that that didn't work, that couldn't be delivered within the time frame that was was sought. So actually. Uh, from a project perspective, we were having to sort of pair it back to first principles, but, but also do that whole uh, engagement piece to uh, get in a new contractor, uh, secure the funding, get a design that worked, uh, and also then get that internal sort of governance approval, um, which is absolutely critical for any project or program to have the organization coming with you and making sure that what you're doing aligns to the um, the organizationals, uh, the organizations, um, uh, strategic vision for the future because you know ultimately if it's not you'll get the you know, your work culled from underneath you because it's not delivering against the plan so <clears throat> i was working in that environment to a program manager um, who had uh, five um, projects uh, varying in size between sort of 40 million up to my project which was the the 200 million pound plus one uh, and and as a program you know, leader, uh, it was very much up to them to make sure that uh, the each individual project venture uh, was um, delivering um, uh, in a way that aligned to the plan. Uh, it was, you know, the governance, so how the money was being spent, that the contracting was being done correctly, and, and also it's being done in a timely fashion. So a lot of, you know, program leaders role becomes much more of a sort of um, management of, of, of people and process as opposed to uh, delivering a particular output uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in infrastructure terms of building a bridge, a road. Uh, it's much more about a program level, making sure that uh, the people and the processes are working correctly. So, um, uh, and one of the things I learned in that area, which is, uh, you know, certainly in the infrastructure environment it, it is a real consideration is about planning uh, nationally significant infrastructure projects and development consent orders. Uh, the, the key element of the planning process that allows you to get major projects agreed at national level. So um, in October last year, uh, I, I moved out of uh, National Highways, uh, which is a client organization. So effectively, they're the ones that call the shots and uh, and they draw in the contractors to, to deliver the work uh, and move to Turner and Townsend, which is a consultancy. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the uh, the diary marker for today, you'll have seen what the uh, uh, the uh, the role of, of Turner and Townsend is in terms of supporting uh, clients and, and customers. So um, one of the questions that popped up in the, in the chat bar I noticed was, uh, you know, how long did you have between arriving on day one and starting your first contract or commission? Uh, for me, Turner and Townsend, it was two days uh, and I was straight in on, on the Wednesday of week one. Um, slightly unusual, uh, I'd come from obviously, you know, a, a, another 
number of other organizations doing something similar. So for me, that was quite a comfortable thing to do. My first consultancy role, uh, I think I was on the bench. So effectively in that sort of holding pattern for about three months initially, which is very much to do with security clearances. Um, so uh, it, it does vary depending on uh, when you join your background experience and what you're doing. So uh, my current role, um, I'm working with the RAF. So having had five years away from uh, the sort of defense environment, I'm now back into the defense environment. Um, and uh, we're doing a, uh, a program which effectively is uh, was conceptualized in a, um, uh, a joint task force between uh, the wind industry and the MOD. Uh, and that's to mitigate the adverse effects of uh, new and larger offshore wind farms uh, on uh, air defense radar. Um, uh, and this is the sort of point to make, you know, in terms of the program, we've effectively initiated from what was a strategic concept to turn it into a program. And I, I previously referred to that sort of mandate, vision and program plans and so on. Effectively, the, the team that's been stood up it, it needs to create all those documents to create that audit trail uh, in a slightly more complicated environment, because as, as opposed to spending MOD money, you're actually spending wind industry money, but obviously having to demonstrate accountability. So the whole sort of governance and processes uh, are slightly more complicated. And a lot of what we're doing is actually creating those from scratch. And uh, I've just stepped out of a meeting with the program team uh, in which we're looking at uh, scheduling, uh, so the plan um, and how how we do that uh, as a sort of uh, collaborative approach between um, defense equipment support and the frontline commands, in this case, the, the RAF. So um, I, I think, um, you know, the, the key mes messaging around my current role is, you know, you've got that um, strategic vision from the, the management team, the, the senior levels, both within um, the, the wind farm developers companies, but also uh, within the MOD. Uh, and how do you then turn that into uh, something that allows you to deliver the uh, program level, the outcomes, realize the benefits, as opposed to a project level, uh, which is outputs uh, and this terminology is something that you know if you get into these courses are, are a key distinction between between those two things so projects deliver a whole series of outputs that cumulatively uh, get after delivering the outcome of, of, of a program um, and uh, of course, you know, in, in governance terms, particularly any organization spending public money um, is, you know, governance is is king. Uh, and as a program manager, uh, you know, it's about managing the people, the stakeholders. And in this case, you know, there's quite a lot of stakeholders because we're talking about something which, you know, it, although it's been delivered as a defense program, um, is obviously working with um, defense contractors, but also um, uh, elements of the wind industry as well. So, uh, you know, making sure that you've got a reporting cycle that works so that when the projects start uh, and the projects obviously to deliver that particular uh, mitigation, um, that they are working within a framework that's been created at program level. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm consciously using a lot of terminology in there. Please do sort of chuck questions at me uh, as we go along, um, but uh, probably enough of, of that. In terms of what does a day in my life look like? Uh, Constantly got a couple of minutes left. Um, so uh, having come into Turner and Townsend, uh, uh, you know, I was talking to people at, at uh, Macy's offices on the employment engagement event uh, sort of 10 days ago uh, and you know, describing um, the, the lived experience on a day to day basis uh, rather akin to a sort of an aircraft carrier. So if you like, um, Turner and Townsend parent office is, is, is the ship. Uh, and then, you know, once you're dispatched on your commission, it's like taking off from the flight deck and off you go to, to, to do whatever you're going to do. Um, in my case, uh, the commission I'm on uh, is has been very much remote. Uh, so everything sort of teams based uh, with a team that's spread between uh, Glasgow and the West Country. So, uh, you know, very much dispersed. Um, uh, and so most of the work uh, since I started in October has been uh, online and therefore is agnostic of location as to, you know, to where you're doing that. So from Turner and Townsend perspective, you know, you do it wherever it works for you and, and gets the work delivered. So for me, uh, that's a bit of a mix of uh, working from home uh, and choosing to come into the office in order to do that internal networking with the wider company. Um, as I've picked up um, uh, internal functional roles in terms of line management, matrix line management of, of, of other project managers, uh, obviously that's given me more reason to come in. And then latterly, as we've started to develop the framework around uh, the program um, and, and the wider team, uh, then actually starting to get those sort of key 
days of engagement and collaborative work, uh, of which today is one of them, uh, with the whole team sitting in the office today, uh, just bouncing ideas off each other and sort of uh, a bit of blue sky thinking, which has been really helpful. Um, so uh, I think the key messaging around sort of my existence within the consultancy environment is it is uh, absolutely very light touch from top down. Uh, you know, you're given your uh, your scope of works and what you need to get on with, uh, and then how you choose to deliver that is very much up to you. And and and, and you know when and where and, and and what that looks like. And you're very much given all the tools to do that, deliver that on day one. Uh, and gone are the days of of, of being in sort of. Um, uh, perhaps a, a regimental environment where you want to get hold of a laptop and you can't get one for love nor money. You know, it's very much the tools of the trade, your mobile phone, your laptop and all the rest of it to get you going on day one. Um, I'll pause there. I'm conscious I've said quite a lot uh, and I've sort of been on a bit of burst transmission, but hopefully there's some elements of that which will allow you to uh, fire some questions or, or just get a flavour for what life uh, at programme level is looking like for me. John, that was excellent. Thank you very much. If I could ask our speakers to to join us, ask Caroline to come back online. Sam, if you're there, thank you for the questions that have come in. So we'll just work through them in a moment. If you do have a burning question, then just please raise your hand. Um, we'll kick off with a few. Sam, thank you for kicking us off. That was excellent. Just one question that I had. Um, I remember from your induction, you were toying between which type of project management, whether it was construction or consultancy. Do you remember your train of thought at that point in time when you were making that decision? What led you down the consultancy route, just with the information that you knew? Uh, so the information I knew at the time was minimal. It was when I actually spoke to uh, friends that were project management in both sides of uh, construction and consultancy uh, and realised that the contractor side of it i think you needed to know and have a bit more experience in the minutiae of running the actual individual day-to-day -day of the projects and and how the projects themselves would be put together um and so i thought my skill set would be best placed in the consultancy role with that kind of overarching view rather than the the the, the detailed view and in hindsight you made the right decision uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. You're thriving. I would say you did. I would definitely say you did. Right, we'll just jump through a couple of the questions that have come in. So the first one was, um, which project management course would you recommend? It seems to be a bit of a minefield. So I'll ask you first, Sam. Um, so to be honest, I think from my understanding of it, having a project management qual is more of a, it gets you through for a kind of a filter. I'm not necessarily sure a specific, whether it's Prince2, APM, uh, Agile, or those kind of things, it, it's not necessarily, it's having the awareness and that transferable skill rather than the actual title on your CV. Um, so for, I did a, I did PMQ, APM, PMQ, um, and that seemed to work for me, but I don't think uh, necessarily having having a specific one is key, if I'm completely honest. But it's having at least one of them would be your advice. Yes, yeah. but there is also have, having one especially, but also having the transferable skills from the military does help get through that filter in itself. Um, and John, yeah. you agree with that over in Turner Townsend? Yeah, I mean, the, the way it was described to me was... Um... Uh, APM PMQ is, is very much generic project management uh, and it's a really great way of uh, understanding the language of project management um, uh, and so that would certainly be my first port of call. Um, the public sector really like Prince2 uh, uh, as I found out when I started my first job and actually had to go and print, do Prince2 even though I felt I'd sort of I got, you know, got through the threshold, I got the job, well done go and do Prince2 um, and that's very much around credibility with clients. Um, so uh, you just have to kind of take that with it but but absolutely what sam says you know there are a, there are a whole variety of, of of courses out there um and actually as you're going to that recruitment process you know the recruiter will look at your cv and say you know what homework has this person done in order to prepare themselves for the, the walk of life they're going into uh, and actually if they can demonstrate that you know you've you've understood the the challenge and, and you've you know done something to get you into the language that's absolutely what you need to be doing. So you know, don't get too hung up on a, on a particular one. Um, okay, yeah. If I can just go back to your sort of first question very briefly, uh, we were yeah. talking about sort of construction versus consultancy, yeah. and, and I kind of describe it slightly differently. Um, so for me, uh, you know, going into uh, a, a project management environment, I, I would describe it more as a choice between um, uh, a client-based organization and a consultancy. Um, uh, and then, you know, in terms of the sectors, it can be construction, it can be IT, it can be whatever you want really you know in terms of of where you deliver those project management functions uh, and i think you know uh 
making that distinction between client side, so a big publicly funded organization like National Highways, uh, the Met Police, whatever it may be, uh, where you're effectively setting the requirements and, and you're bringing in people to do the work versus um, sort of consultancy, which may be pitching in to help the client with some of that, you know, requirement setting and, and, and getting people in. Uh, and then that sort of third entity, which is delivery. So a delivery organization like, you know, uh, uh, elements of MACE, um, uh, you know, BAM, Balfour BT, uh, the big sort of construction firms. Uh, and actually, you know, which bit of that you, you jump into is, is actually quite important because, um, you know, what will float your boat and, and, and you know, give you a, a job you enjoy is very much shaped by, you know, that choice. Uh, and, you know, very much well worth having a conversation with people who are sitting in those environments before you make that choice, because uh, uh, it's a bit impenetrable uh, you know, when, you're, when you're first stepping out. OK, no, great points there, John. Um, just to reiterate um, on the training question, it came in. Again, I find Prince 2 process and themes. APM is a bit more broad spectrum. We tend to find the majority of employers are looking for at least one project management qualification. So, um, but again, where you're pursuing that career will dictate which one is preferable for you, but either one of those two are a safe choice. Um, in terms of the sector, it is difficult in terms of because we'd ask this question all the time. Is it cons consultancy? Is it construction? I think I want to be project management. I'm not sure. So I think probably exactly as John said, you get closer to the people that are doing it. You get closer to the employers. Um, if you're able to feel it and see it and touch it, whether it's on career chats, whether it's um, sitting with your mentor, whether it's getting to site for a day, um, it just allows you to for you to find your definition of what it looks like and what's going to suit you. Um, in terms of some of the other questions that are coming in, um, I did like the question about working from home, who's monitoring you, who's keeping an eye on you. I think probably perception there is the connectivity piece is really important in hybrid working and if you're working from home. So for an employer, keeping you motivated and valued, um, the company benefits from that output. So it's in their interest to invest in the infrastructure or, or the culture they're trying to create or the process that keeps you linked up and replicating the team spirit and allows collaboration, I think, as, as John had said, because that's really important for a, a team to thrive and to be at their absolute best. Um, any advice that you would give someone working from home, Sam, if you're doing it a lot at the moment? I think a lot of the time is actually be willing to have those conversations with people and engage with people. Um, Teams, especially now, I found from when I first started to now is basically the same as walking up to someone in an office and having that conversation. Maybe a quick message to say, are you are you free at the moment? But actually having that confidence to just call people on teams um, is is key and bringing that people in and working in a collaborative in manner rather than just sitting there on your own struggling. Because there were points when I first started that I was like that and I it wasn't particularly enjoyable. Okay, and another question that's come in from Rob, you, you started a topic theme here, Rob, in terms of um, when you start, should you leave the armed forces and move straight into a new role? So appreciating that you've all got bills to pay, you've got your own self-esteem and ego to manage, you are looking for that stability to be able to move straight into employment. So we do understand why somebody wants to move from one into the other. Maybe they've had a good resettlement period where they've been able to demilitarize and take the foot off the gas and just be able to, to unwind before they start. For other people, they're working up until the minute they hand that uniform in and then they're jumping straight into the fire with that civilian employment. Our advice is if you can take the time, if you've got faith in yourself to take a couple of months whilst you're still out there actively searching for recruitment it can be a good idea other people just like the structure of having that permanent employment having an income coming in i think everybody's situations are different john any advice that you would give there yeah i mean you know it comes down to money a lot of the time you know if you've got the ability and you can fund yourself to go and do it for a bit that's lovely because actually uh you don't realize even if you are preparing yourself to step into a civilian role, the degree to which you're still very much inculcated in the military environment. Um, so it, it is that sort of decompression bit. But, you know, it's not essential. I think the critical thing is, you know, not finding yourself six months into a new job, still wondering what's going on, because in your mind, you're still sitting in, you know, in, in green or blue kit, you know, in a military environment. Uh, and, you know, it's not something you can do overnight. Even taking six months out doesn't stop you doing that. You know, I still 
you know, <laughs> for those sort of thoughts about, uh, you know, the, the military environment five years on. So um, it, it's not going to be the be all and end all. And if you need to jump straight into a, another job, then that that's fine. But what I would say is um, just be conscious as you're going into your job that if you go into a really high pressure job and you pitch yourself into an organization you know at a level where you've just got to perform to, to justify your existence as it were um it just becomes that little bit harder if you, you haven't sort of created that space to allow you 100 percent focus on the on the new thing and a question from shane to you john are you having a work-life balance do you see your family more has it worked in your favor yeah living? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, it was really interesting. I hadn't realized the degree to which a lot of the things that you're doing outside work are either with work colleagues or they're connected to the military organization and the rest of it. And suddenly you find yourself, you know, uh, uh, you know, stand fast commuting into London and the rest of it, which I don't do every day. Um, uh, you know, you suddenly got an evening back and you're like, I don't remember this is the sort of amount of time, you know, and, you know, finding yourself going and doing the local car club or doing stuff in a gym or going for a run in a way that, you know, I suppose I must have done it previously. But uh, that and particularly sort of weekends and other bits and pieces, which are, you know, we'd all recognise as being our own time. Just there suddenly seemed to be a lot less pressure to do stuff that was aligned to work. And therefore, it's it's very it's just literally a blank canvas. You know, there's no there's no obvious thing to plug into. So having you know your hobbies and your things that you want to do lined up uh, and you know jumping into them is really really good. Okay, we well, should be using that time loading that dishwasher, making your wife a cup of tea. <laughs> that the evenings are all about. And gardening. Sam, to you, yeah, gardening. <laughs> Sam, to you, you are working from home. Are you glued to your laptop? Are you doing more hours working from home? Do you think? Are you getting a good balance? um i it all depends on the workload i've got to be honest it, it's down to me to balance to balance my time um i i personally think that during the day if i if i need to take my dogs for a walk i'll take my dogs for a walk and, and i it's up to me to manage that time so i i will work a general kind of eight hour day eight and a half hour day and i can i have the freedom to spread that how i want so as far as the actual work-life balance yeah i, I would suggest that mine at the moment is, is good because I, I get that freedom to to choose how I break up that time. Obviously, I, I do most of my work during the working day, um, but but it's kind of needs must. OK, and a lot of our service leavers will be looking at the kind of here and now. What's that first couple of weeks or months going to look like? Am I going to be capable? Can I do it? Um, who am I going to ask if I've got a question? Um, the theme's been picked up, Sam's asked the question, but the theme's been picked up by a few that there will be buddy systems in place. There will be a veteran community that you're very much ingrained in. And, and can you both give comfort that that's very much what it looks like within your organisations? There's that network around, that support during that three month onboarding process. And yeah, that I'm... helped you, John, that helped you settle in. I mean, certainly looking at a Turner and Townsend perspective, you know, quite aside from the military networking, perspective and there's a really good military network and uh, and a good group of ex-military people here um uh you know day one you're assigned a buddy who was at the same level of you as you come into the organization he literally is there to sit next to you and go you know this is how you do this this, this is where things show you around taking out for lunch on day one um uh, and then you know that plus your line manager very much sort of I hesitate to say hand holding, but you know as much support as you want in the first sort of month, just to make sure that you're comfortable and you understand the organisation and, and and you're sort of becoming uh, brought in. The military network, you know, for, for us sits uh, as another layer on top of that, uh, and you know you very quickly get to realize that there's a whole group of people who speak the same language from shared experience in the back uh and you know bump it in for coffee or, or whatever it may be uh, and that's almost like a secondary layer to the, the the initial bit which i think you know most of the sort of consultancy environments very much try and push to make sure that you're you're brought into the organization and, and you know made part of the team as it were rather than uh just expected to you know uh, live by your own devices as you were OK, and a question to you, John, you've whet the appetite on progr program management. So I think you're, you're going to have an influx after this. But for somebody sitting in an interview, for a service leaver sitting in front of you, um, applying for that program management role, did it, do you need convinced that they are a project manager through and through? Or are you looking to see some strategic skills for them to go straight into the program management role? How would you advise they navigate that? Um, so I think, um, you know, it, there needs to be some element of of how they're presenting themselves that doesn't just say I've done a lot of projects. 
but actually we, yeah, we want to clearly say there's a grounding in that sort of project activity because ultimately that's the building blocks that lead to programs that lead to portfolios um so it's effectively operating in that sort of um slightly more ambiguous space so you know taking a strategy uh you know blank sheet of paper turning it into something in terms of a framework and a structure that you can then start uh you know launching projects from so it, it, it's it's that ability to work with ambiguity and to you know sam mentioned the whole sort of business about stakeholder engagement and people management you know it, it, it's absolutely about those sort of skills that are really important at the program space because often you're coming into something that isn't a formed entity uh, and you need to create it from scratch so that ability to work with people as opposed to just you know being the perfectly formed project manager it, it's those soft skills which actually you know people have in spades in that sort of transferable market um uh, but it's just demonstrating the kind of environments and evidencing how you might have you know worked with those kind of um concepts previously alongside you know things like managing successful programs which is a great tick in the box if you've done that because that you know again says you're thinking in that next level of um process as it were perfect okay and you, you the military experience absolutely meets that criteria doesn't it you don't want them to be selling themselves as anything else other than what you've done it's enough to open the door into program management yeah, it's yeah. you know it, the people when you're doing your CVs, it's all about translating your military experience into something that somebody in you know Mace or Turin Townsend or Balfour Beatty can understand. So it's just trying to think. Well, you know, look at what I'm doing. It's not about reflecting uh, where you were and what was going on around you. It's you know what was I doing? What 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 part did I have in all of this? Uh, and and what what value did I add? And you know what what did that mean for me kind of thing and if you can bring that out that shows that you've you know you've added value into something which is inherently complex and difficult that comes across really well in in cvs and allows that sort of conversation to take place okay and a key role for both of you is that business development piece you add out there actively securing new work working on bids people will dip into any skills and expertise that you've got if they are working on live bids some of the questions come in from charlie and um, but that future work pipeline it certainly forms part of all our day jobs um lots of focus on transferable skills have you recognized any gaps in yourself and did you try to fill the gaps um whilst you were going through that employment stage or did you just recognize what you were weak in and then have a, a career development plan over one or two years. You obviously can't learn everything during this resettlement period. So I think the question is probably what do you prioritize on? So I found it was as a, as a the difference between the soft and the hard skills. It was definitely the hard skills that I, I struggled with. Um, the communication piece and things like that, I, I personally didn't necessarily struggle with it. It's the understanding of things like contracts um and those elements of it and, and the mace processes that i i wasn't necessarily aware of when i first joined but it's you get those through the experience when it comes to kind of contracts there are courses you can do sort of nec ppc those those kind of courses you can do um specifically i know if mace if require you to do an nec course they, they will put you on that so it's, it's kind of those it's those gaps the hard skill gaps that i i am finding that i i am now learning as i go rather than the the transferable skills if that makes sense it does yeah yeah and yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I would add, you know, one of the things that people often say in 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 this environment is uh, finance, because in MOD, finance is sort of kept at arm's reach and you don't really get into that detail. Um, and, you know, I, that that sort of concerned me a lot going out and I bought books to try and sort of understand how I could do that better. And, and the thing you realise very quickly is that actually there is, um, you know, fin financial management, uh, sorry, financial accounting and management accounting and, and the distinction between the two is you know financial accounting is what accountants do management accounting is what project managers do so as long as you you kind of understand you know enough about what the numbers are trying to tell you actually there are people with huge amounts of knowledge in in most organizations on the sort of financial accounting perspective who you can have very closely alongside and they'll make sure that the spreadsheets producing the right numbers it's then up to you as a project manager to understand the numbers and be able to, 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 to understand what they're telling you and 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 therefore once you start getting into that area you suddenly realize that it's not quite as daunting as it first seems um you know it's a different challenge uh, and you know absolutely you know companies will make sure that you're furnished with the the right training uh you know if there's, if there's specific 
uh, emissions, uh, but it is those sort of broad skills, which APM is a really good way of just you know wave topping a whole series of stuff very quickly, uh, and, and you'll quickly understand the bits that you understand well and, and those you don't. Fantastic. Well, listen, thank you to Sam and Jordan for their incredible contribution today. I think careers in programme management and project management will keep you both kind of challenged, enthralled and involved in rebuilding this great country, as, as John has said. So we've heard from excellent employers today with both Mace and Turner and Townsend. So a shout out to them for continuing to be excellent ambassadors supporting our armed forces. Remember, you're not alone. Build Force are here to help and support. I will pass back to Caroline for final insights. Thanks, Angela. Um, thanks, chaps. I, I knew it was going to be great. So, so thank you for that. Um, and as you can see, attendance has been amazing. So to anyone out there that wants our support, please do just register with us. A member of the team will take you through the programme and what we can support with. Um, there's such things as this, mentoring, workplaces, etc. So please do take advantage of us. So next events coming up on the 25th of May is our next virtual career chat with our employer, International Engineering and Construction Company, Langer rock so please do join us and see what the construction side has to offer and see what langer rock has to offer and then also come and join sam and the rest of the build force team on the 30th of may if you're a rugby player we're looking for more rugby players we've nearly got a team we're taking on construction we're gonna win okay um so please do get in touch or spread the words because we're a couple of men or girls short for to make the team so um, that's a wrap for today. Um, as I say, enjoy your bank holiday, but we've had, we've had to already. So enjoy your weekend and um, yeah, just get in touch. Thanks everyone, bye. Thank you, thanks John, thanks Sam. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye. No worries, have a good day, thanks, cheers. Everyone.